Hi, I'm Rob Butler, I'm a cardiologist in Stoke. Uh, my area of expertise is putting balloons and stents into people's arteries to unblock them, often in the context of a heart attack. So a heart attack is actually much more complicated than you would think. People think it's going to be a blocked artery and we will treat that, but heart attacks in hospital are often diagnosed by the blood, a blood test and that blood test is troponin. And we label these as type 1 heart attacks, which is what we would assume most people would expect. It's a blocked artery, you have a narrowing, you may or may not have had angina, followed by an, an acute sudden blockage, usually driven by a blood clot. And that's when you come into hospital. Lots of other times we'll see troponin is positive and we then spend time hunting for a cause that may or may not be related to the heart. We call those type 2 heart attacks. So symptoms again, so can be quite similar to angina. You know, the, 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 the nerve pathway that supplies the heart muscle is the same and whether you have angina or a heart attack, the pain's very similar. The difference with angina is that you walk and the pain will come on and you stop walking and the pain will go away. The difference with a, with a heart attack is that that blockage is, is there and won't go away. So the angina starts and it just keeps coming and coming and coming. And then you start to get the pain, it becomes more severe, it doesn't ease off. And then you start to get things like it radiating down the arms, it goes through to the back, you start sweating and feeling pale and clammy, you get some palpitations. And it's really that, that process of recognizing that angina is something that comes and goes, that will respond to the spray, whereas it heart attacks, something that come and will not stop until you call for help. So a heart attack differs from angina insofar as angina is driven by, in the main, by firming up in the artery. So over time, your diabetes, blood pressure, cholesterol, all those things cause a, a blockage and that blockage prevents blood going past it. And that causes the angina. The more severe the narrowing, the more the, the blockage will cause angina. So if you've got a, a moderate narrowing, um, you, you might get angina only if you really push yourself. If it's really tight, you might get it walking from room to room. You can have mild narrowings and you might get no angina at all, no matter how hard you pushed yourself. With a heart attack, what differs is that that, that plaque of cholesterol splits. And when blood gets inside the plaque, it clots. And the heart attack is driven by the clot, not the narrowing. And so everything that we do is about trying to prevent recurrence of clot or moving the clot on. So the balloons and stents that we put in in an emergency are there to open that artery up, to push the cholesterol plaque out of the way and to move the clot on. So a heart attack can be treated in different ways. And again, there's, there's different phases of it. We roughly split heart attacks into two separate groups. They're separated by, by what the ECG looks like. So when you call for help and the ambulance pitches up, they'll do an ECG and the purpose of that ECG is A, to say, are you having a heart attack? But to stream you into two different pathways. One is where the ECG has a particular pattern called an ST elevation or a STEMI. And that group of patients will ordinarily come in by ambulance, they'd come straight to the, the heart attack center in Stoke, you'd come to the cath lab and we would unblock the artery, put in a stent to stop the heart attack. The second track are the non-ST elevation, non-STEMI heart attacks. Now they have a slightly different pattern and early balloons and stents actually can do harm in that group. So that group tend to come in, they start the tablets and they will have an angiogram where we look at the arteries and go in through the wrist and around into the heart, take the pictures. But they'll have that, that process at day two to three and then almost immediately go home often. And they may then have balloons, stents, even bypass surgery as an inpatient. It's quite possible that you could come in with the first one, a STEMI, we could deal with the heart attack artery, but actually we, there's lots of other narrowings and you end up having a bypass. So once we've done the emergency stuff, there's the long-term stuff of treating a heart attack and that's about trying to prevent another one. And that's all the risk factor stuff that we should be doing for angina. It's statins, it's aspirin, it's beta blockers, it's being fitter, it's being lighter, it's stopping smoking, treating the blood pressure and, the, and, and diabetes, etc. 
Unfortunately, the answer is yes. Because the, the presence of the heart attack is telling us that you've got coronary artery disease that's furring up in the arteries, and so your risk is, is higher compared to somebody who has no coronary artery disease. What's important to recognise though is that when we, when we start treating those risk factors and we start treating all the bits and pieces that go with it, your risk drops dramatically. So your risk before you've had a heart attack, although you don't know what that is at the time, drops dramatically as we treat it with the balloons and the stents and the bypass and the statins and all the other drugs that, that come. So undoubtedly, un unfortunately, your risk in the long term is higher than somebody who has no coronary disease. So reducing risk from heart attacks and angina is, is almost identical. It's, it's, it's stuff like stopping smoking, losing weight, improving the fitness, treating the other risk factors such as diabetes, blood pressure, cholesterol. There's nothing fancy about it, it but they're the things that really drive long-term survival. If we get the risk factors down, particularly cholesterol, if we get cholesterol down to a certain level, the evidence strongly supports that we can stop those narrowings getting worse. And the, the mainstay of that is statins. And the problem is when people are stopping and starting the, the statin drugs, the moment they stop it, those plaques of cholesterol start marching on again. So a, a heart attack is, is driven by the plaque of cholesterol that ruptures and a clot forms on it and it blocks the artery and it starts to damage the muscle and you get pain. You know, a heart attack could then be complicated by a cardiac arrest and a cardiac arrest is where the heart rhythm becomes unstable and that, that rhythm, often ventricular fibrillation, it's called VF uh, when you hear it on, in, on, on the media, is, is then not, not survivable. If we don't do something about it, then the patient will die. And the whole premise of coronary care units, when coronary care units were set up in the 70s, was all about treating ventricular fibrillation in the context of a heart attack, because that's what, that's what killed people. And it made a massive difference to heart attack patients' survival simply by having coronary cares and the treatment of ventricular fibrillation. And it's part of the recommendation why, if you have chest pain, we tell you to dial 999 and come in by ambulance because the risk of that cardiac arrest component is highest at the time of your heart attack and disappears really quickly within the first 24 hours, that risk all but disappears. So if you're, if you're driving in and you have a cardiac arrest, that's really difficult and has a bad outcome. If the ambulance team are with you, the chance of them resuscitating you is much, much higher. So when you have a heart attack, calling for help and waiting for the ambulance is almost always the right thing to do. So some people after a heart attack will find actually they are better than they were before, particularly if they had angina beforehand. So because they, they'll come in, we'll see what the arteries look like, we can adjust the tablet treatment, they may need balloons and stents or bypass surgery, so their angina may be significantly better. The downside is, is if the heart attack's been a big one or patients are presented late in the process and the damage is already done, they can then be left with, with breathlessness because the heart can't pump as well. And that process is called heart failure. So people can come in, have never had angina, have a heart attack, have no damage, go home and live absolutely normally, other than the fact that we give them tablets. The other end of the spectrum, people who come in, they may be late coming in, they have a heart attack, and they end up quite limited by their breathlessness. Exercise after heart attacks is much the same as exercise with angina. The heart has to heal up after a heart attack. That process takes four to six weeks. So exercise should be reduced at the beginning, gradually built up. In the longer term, exercise at a mild to moderate intensity is really important. It reduces risk. So if you increase your fitness, you lose weight, then you reduce your risk of further events, whether that's angina or heart attack. If you have a, a, an urge to do a lot of exercise and intense exercise, then that is exactly the same as with angina. Risk starts to go up and that needs to have a fairly frank discussion with the clinical team about whether that's advisable. And if you do decide to do it, whether you just accept the risks that that entails. Mm -hmm.